Before I get started, we just need to make sure it ain't none of y'all starting no betting pool. Everybody get that? What betting pool, what I'm talking about is how long Butch is able to hold on to that <laughs> I already made it longer than I thought it was going to be. <coughs> well, good to see everyone today. Good to see our folks, new folks, visitors. So glad to have you with us today. I'm going to hold on to my text for just a little bit. I want to introduce this and I'll get deeper into this thought here in a, in a while. I had somebody ask me about 15 years ago, and the reason I'm able to date that time period is because I know where I was when they asked me. I was actually in Texas at the time. I was actually at a pastor's conference. I preach at a pastor's conference every year down um, about an hour and a half north, north of Houston there in December. And uh, there was about 115, 135 pastors there, different men from the churches, this, that, the other. Brother Jim Moss that comes here in the spring to do our revival, he uh, puts on this, this Bible conference. And, and, uh, and some of the men that, that, uh, preach, that he preaches in their churches throughout the year have preached in turn there. It uh, starts on a Sunday evening, um, afternoon, late Sunday afternoon, we'll have either two to four preachers that Sunday night, be all day long Monday, and then Tuesday to about two o'clock, and then we have a great big old 20 ounce steak and say goodbye and go home. But I had a pastor there several years ago um, ask me a question. And he simply asked me, he says, why do you think that we, we see such a change in this generation, again, the time we're living now, this generation of Christians in our churches, why do you think we see such a change and then its effect on the church that they attend itself? <coughs> well, I didn't have to think about it because it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And so I give you the answer to that question this morning. Now let me let me say something that uh, some of you figured out a long time ago. I don't know everything, but uh, this is something that, that that sticks on my mind, and I, I've watched this as it's um, gone through the years. And, and but I think the number one problem, the number one problem. In, and let me use this term, in Christians, in today's Christianity, and why this generation seems to be, shall we say, less faithful, less uh, grounded in the Word, um, things of that nature, less steadfast, all of which we are commanded to be. And some of you, you're watching me hold this book, and you say, well, he's going to say it's because we don't read the Bible. Well, that's only a part of it. That's just the first part. You see, there's the reading of the Word, and then there's the understanding of the principle of that which you're reading. And furthermore, when you get that, take the principle of what God's teaching, there has to be application. Amen. And that's a problem. That's our problem in, in modern day churches. Everywhere, you know, I don't I don't travel a lot and, and preach anymore, but but I do know a lot of pastors and do talk to a lot. And why in this world God ever chose me to be the one that all these pastors call to, 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 to try to get? I I just rather they didn't call me, call somebody else, but they do. Folks, you have to understand the principles and the things of what God's teaching. I'm going to start off with an illustration that probably all of you here have heard before. And even as I, and I started to have the picture so Rebecca could put it up, but I didn't have time for all that. 
But you have heard, I'm sure, how that you can take a frog and put him in a pot of water and set him on the stove and turn that heat up on that stove gradually, bit by bit. To the point where it's so hot, where it's boiling hot, there's nothing that frog can do about it anymore. Now. That's a that's a well-known illustration. But what can we do? How can we take that illustration and then apply the principles to the things that you and I face? It's very simple. Today, as we develop this, you need to understand, I'm, I'm this morning, for right now, I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking about those that know for sure if they die today, they're going to heaven. Because these principles apply to your life every second of every day. And I'm going to use a, 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 a common example here of something that we're all aware of. Of something that, 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 we're, that we're, we're familiar with and, and perhaps have seen its effect in our own lives. And it's forms of entertainment. Forms of entertainment. Let's just watch how this has desensitized us. You turn on your TV and you watch this movie and you watch that movie and watch all these other different things happen. Not only yourself, but to other people that's in the home with you. And let's just take one aspect of the entertainment. Let's just take violence, for example. The more violence you watch, no matter where, what it comes from, what medium it comes from, whether it be the shooting and killing and everything else and in the movies or, the, or all the video games of the day, Amen? Right. All this trash that we take in constantly is a continual attack upon your mind. That's right. It's continuous. And all we have to do is think about, if you will be honest with yourself, you will be able to see and say, you know what? This right here that I'm watching now or that somebody referred to used to bother me a whole lot. But now I watch it and it doesn't bother me as much. Uh, How is that? That's because of people being desensitized. That's right. Being desensitized. And we watch this movie. And when I say we, it's not, it's, confined, it's not necessarily confined to us here or only us or whatever the case might be. I'm just talking about us as human beings, primarily us as Christians. But as we take in this trash over and over and over and over, it becomes so normal to us. It becomes so normal to our children and our children's children Amen. that understand it's literally not just in our eyes, but in our mind and in our heart. It's devaluing human life. I remember as a child, I don't know the year, I just, I just know it was early. I was born in 62, so let's just say 69, 70, 71, somewhere right in there, I don't know. But I remember a live broadcast on TV in a hostage situation overseas. And I remember seeing live on TV before they could do anything about it, I remember seeing somebody shot right through their temple. Yes. Yes. That bothered me for weeks and weeks and weeks.
Now we see stuff on TV where that's just a continuous thing. It's no big deal. Yes. So well, what's the point of all this? Praise God, he's good, man. But when we devalue human life, we are also devaluing suffering. We'll come back to that in just a bit. We're at a time of the year. This really is not, this is not necessarily the reason that I bring this up, but it's something that we face. We face it 12 months a year, but there's an added influence in Halloween time. Turn your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read through these few verses here. But I want you to think about these things. It's very good that as we open our Bibles and as we read, as we that we underline phrases Amen. in these scriptures. We have a notebook. We can jot things down. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. It's very familiar chapter but for another verse that we'll actually we will get to in just a bit but I want to read something first <coughs> the premise of the entire chapter is in verse number one and it'll not be on the screen we'll come to the screen for us a little bit but I want you to look at verse number one of chapter four it says therefore my brethren dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown so, or therefore, or thusly, stand fast in the Lord. Amen. Don't underline that in your Bible. This is not Paul making a suggestion. This is not Paul, shall we say, making this, in, in this well, let me just add this here. Just, 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 I'm kind of closing this out. And uh, let, me, let me share this with you. No, this is a command directly from the throne of God. As a child of God, we are commanded to be steadfast, unmovable in the face, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But you don't become steadfast and immovable upon, shall we say, your salvation itself. That's just the beginning, that's the enabling, that's the building of the foundation that will allow you to do so. That's the start. Some would say, well, that's chapter one. Well, yeah, okay, we, can, we can use that. Tip, that, that. <laughs> but we're commanded here to stand fast in the Lord. And so then he goes through some things throughout this chapter that will, shall we say, enable you or show you how to do that. And there's some, there's, there's some here that, that, that's actually listed before where I want to begin, but I want to begin in verse number six. Amen. The term there in the King James says, be careful for nothing, but it's actually be anxious for nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty much where I have to kind of stop reading and get a hold of some things. You know, I've been pastoring for, for, in, in the ministry for about 35 years. And people automatically think that preachers don't have no problems. Yeah. People automatically think that, uh, you know what? People are never ugly to preachers. Yeah. Okay. People never do preachers wrong. Oh, yeah. By the way, brother, time out. When you're praying for patience, don't go to Walmart parking lot. Amen. Okay. Back to the message. <clears throat> Whenever I was a younger, probably the first 
28, 29 years of my life, I didn't learn about anything. Nothing. Coincidentally, that's about the time I got married. <laughs> Don't read anything into that. But, uh, man, I have, to, I have to bear down not to worry. And then, there's actually times when everything, you know, even in the midst of problems and situations, there, there's times where, where in, 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 in praying and, and again, it's just, it's in believing God, all the other, when you don't worry and you'll feel guilty for not worrying. Amen. Am I the only one here? Be anxious. And this, this word in the Greek here, as is, he is, 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 is makes this commandment, again, it embodies everything about who God is, embodies all of his promises to you and his power. And so whenever we, we, we will slow down and stop thinking about these things and, and, and see that, you know what? It, it's, oh, oh, makes it a little easier. But let's watch what he goes to, where he goes right here. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Be careful, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Don't underline that. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving's there, because it's a recognition of who God is. Amen. Recognition of his promises. Recognition that he'll never leave you or never fail you. Recognition that he has got it under control. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Amen. And then we get to verse 8. And quite frankly, verse 8 is the reason for today's message. Because quite frankly, this is where we're messing up. This is where what we're not doing. We just kind of, hey, I've, I've received Christ, I'm saved, I'm baptized, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to church, you know, here, there, you know, I'm doing these things, and, and, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to. Just my boat's sailing, and I'm just waiting for the Lord to come get us. Get us out of here and go to heaven. Well, let me tell you something. There's a whole lot that you're commanded to do between the time when you're on your knees and the time he takes you away from here. But what we need to understand, what you need to understand, what I need to understand is, is that this world hates you. Satan hates you. And the Bible tells us, he tells us himself. Whenever he appears before God there at the throne in the book of Job, as was, as was mentioned earlier. Oh, I'm just kind of going back and forth looking who I can mess up. And that's a first phrase. But the Bible tells us in 1 Peter that what? Going to and fro, what? Seeking what? Whom he may what? The Bible. Destroy. He don't take no days off. He don't take no time off. Now let me just make sure we understand something here according to the word of God. Satan don't make you sin. Amen. We still have this old flesh. Yeah, we still have this old flesh. We still war with the flesh. Things of this nature. Yes, there are spiritual attacks and different things. He don't make you do nothing. He didn't make Eve bite into whatever that fruit was. Yeah. We just, you know, yeah. use the term the apple, but whatever it was. She chose to. But she had sinned before she ever put that in her mouth. Yes. <clears throat> we get caught up in today's world of how much we can get away with That's as a Christian. Right. Okay. Y'all hear me? Is it okay for me to do this? Is it okay for me to do that? 
But can I tell you, in Satan's hate for you, in this world's hate for you, there is a place that it attacks. And that's your mind. That's your mind. Verse number eight. We have a command here. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, well, quite frankly, every single service that we meet, that's that phrase, that's what we meet by. That's right. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the what? Truth. The truth and the life. He is true. We're to dwell on these things. Continue to read and say, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, and then look at these last four words. Underline them in your Bible. Say them, let's say them together. Think on these things. And this think here doesn't mean a fleeting thought like we think. It means to dwell on it. To analyze it. And so guess what? We're back to what my opening statement was. About seeing the principles of Scripture as we read them. Okay? Chewing on them, if we want to use that. Thinking about them, thinking about them, thinking about these things in these Scriptures and what God's teaching us through these passages. We're on Wednesday night, we're, we're studying the Old Testament. We are looking at, we're in the latter part of the book of Leviticus. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is the children of Israel, before God got a hold of them and got them out of Egypt and got them off out there by themselves on his mind, that they, they just automatically think, well, they knew everything they were supposed to do. They didn't know nothing. Amen. And God is teaching them what holiness is. Why? Because that has to be the standard. Anything moving away from that standard one iota is sin. Amen. Say, think on these things. It means to concentrate, to analyze spiritually. Why? Why? So that we can apply them to our lives. Amen. When going through these lists of these type of things, anything whatsoever in our lives that conflicts with that, we got to get rid of it. That's right. Amen. I had somebody a while back that was here said later after being in one of our services, that preacher thinks that, 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 that the Bible has all the answers. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've had this said to me before multiple times. Preacher, you just have to be more realistic. <laughs> well, let me tell you what. If that's your attitude, then you're just looking for an excuse to right. sin against the Holy God. Amen. And you have no, shall we say, um, you, you, have, you, have, you have no you plan whatsoever to obey. You realize that most so-called Christians will run up down the road to talk to a different preacher about what the Bible says? If you go up now long enough, you'll find one that will agree with your position. Amen. So that you can justify doing what you're doing. Yeah. Come on. I've seen it many times. You said, well, pray, pray you said a while ago, you don't have all the answers. No, I don't. Amen. But I know when the Word of God says for you to do something, you do it. I'm not very small, but I know if we have this standard in our heart, we look upon these standards, and we hold it true within ourselves, and we study the Word of God, and we pray over the Word of God, and we chew the Word of God, and we constantly analyze and focus on the way He says, I got news, good news. All this trash is starting to level us out. I didn't say you wouldn't go have any problems. Right. You're going to have problems. But your perspective on the problems will change. Amen. 
The closer you get, the closer I get to God himself through his word and it alone, the more things change in our lives. You say, well, does that mean two weeks? No. That means the rest of your life. So staying in Philippians chapter 4, let's look at the most famous verse in the book of Philippians. And let's see here for just a moment how it's mischaracterized, misused in even Christians' hearts and minds. Because it is misused. 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You say, are you saying to me that that's not true? No, it is true. But it's true in a different sense than we might think. It is not a verse for us all of a sudden when we're in trouble to reach up and grab onto a knot in the rope and say, God's taking care of me and I'm going to be able to endure it. No, this verse is to be a mindset. It's to be, to be an attitude of our heart. Again, of God's strength in our lives, no matter what we're faced, and that we're to keep on keeping on, keep on doing the things that he's commanded us to do in his strength, and he will accomplish through us what he saved to accomplish through us in the first place. That's what 413 is all about. It's, it, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a second handle on a parachute. It's our life. In Jesus Christ. Amen. God saved you for a reason. From eternity past, He desired that you spend eternity in heaven with Him. It didn't just, well, you know what? Yeah, there was another baby born today. Butch Dicks, that's what they named him. You know what? I want him to be in heaven with me. No. The Bible says that before the world began, he knew your name. We won't be having any classes with me explaining how that's possible. Everybody understand that? Because I can't do it. I just know God said it. But when he saves you, it's far, far more than just to keep you out of hell. His desire is to use you. Use you as his vessel on this earth. Every single thing that you do, your acts and actions, they either bring honor to the Lord or dishonor. Right. Now, in going through all these things and looking at this, and as I said earlier, this is this is this is a commandment to born again Christians. If you're here today and you don't know for sure if you died today, you can go to heaven. You need to understand you can know. Right. You can know for sure. That and right there where you said, I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes, nobody looking around. The Bible teaches us that we get saved because the Holy Spirit of God convicts our hearts of our sin. Yes. And that's the only way. You can't get saved apart from it. But if you're here right now, and this question has been heavy on your mind. There's something that's been bothering you. Maybe you even thinking about it more today. Maybe you maybe you just can't stand it no more. You also need to understand there's only one way to get to heaven. Only one way. And that's what God said. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, well, what is that way? How can I go to heaven? What does it? What? What? What do I have to do to be saved? First, number one, you have to recognize that you're a sinner, that you're guilty. Secondly, by faith, you must believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, 
to pay your sin debt. He died in your place as your substitute because you, you can't do anything at all. You say, well, is that it? No. Knowing that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus Christ died for you, then we must repent of our sin. Repent means, that first of all, convicting our heart. Our heart, will, we, we, our heart will be heavy. We'll have a very, very uneasy feeling about our sin. Some people have used the term feeling dirty before God. All of those apply. But again, realizing that we're sinning against God and the Holy Spirit conviction on our heart, we, we don't want any part of that. We want to be different. And repentance is turning away from that spiritually. Turning away and trusting in Him. We must ask God then to forgive us of our sins. And to save our soul, be merciful upon us as sin. God makes a promise to us. And remember, God does not lie. He keeps all his promises. He makes a promise. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. If your heart is heavy today, If you want to know this day for sure before you walk out this door, get this settled today. In just a few moments, Brother Bill's going to come up. Well, he's going to sing. We're going to stand, have a hymn of invitation. I just want to ask you just to step out where you are. Come down here and let me talk with you for a few minutes. Let's open the Bible and let's look at these verses that I've just described. Perhaps today... God is dealing with you as a Christian on different different terms, different things, different things in, in, in your life that you need to get lined out. Don't put it off. Take care of this today. Father, help us this day, each and every one, to do what you brought us here today to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.